Welcome to day 17 of your 30-day dental MBA, fortifying your practice with cosmetic dentistry. Of course, day 16 was external marketing that just bleeds right into cosmetic practice. Uh, let's just continue. Um, to fortify your practice with cosmetic dentistry, first of all, you're gonna have to position yourself. You have to let these people know you have a, a product that's different than someone else's. A commodity, uh, you cannot distinguish your product from someone else's. Who cares where you got your pound of silver, your pound of gold, your bushel of wheat, or your pound of concrete? Concrete's concrete, silver, silver, gold's gold. And you're gonna have to start externally marketing a unique selling proposition of best product, best price, or best service, so that in the eyes of the consumer, crisply, succinctly, concisely, they can see in a Gettysburg address of 270 words or less that you have something different and they're gonna do business with you. 1-800-DENTIST is fantastic at doing this. I cannot believe, uh, I, I've been on this for, for eons, I cannot believe the people say, oh, I heard it's not very good, yet if you go to California where they started, most all their markets have anywhere between a four and a five year waiting list. And like I said earlier, my very good friend, Michael DeTola, you should hear him lecture. That guy um, graduated about a year after I did from University Pacific. He's still on the waiting list today, trying to get 1-800 dentists, yet you have dentists uh, in other markets where they're at saying, oh, I don't think it works very good. And I say, well, why do you think it not works very good? And they go, first of all, it's $1,500. I say, well, they, they guarantee you 15 new patients a month. And they go, well, I wouldn't pay $100 for a head for a patient. And I'll say, well, if a patient came in and you take an FMX, a full set of x-rays and exam, that's over hundred bucks. You're telling me that if you went to a football stadium and everybody stood up and said, Dennis, if you come over here and give me a free set of x-rays and a free exam, I'll be your patient. You wouldn't do that deal. I mean, come on, you have to think like a businessman. 1-800-DENTIST is not everywhere, but they're, they're in about half the states. And when I say 1-800-DENTIST, um, I know a lot of people in some states don't know what I'm, I, I'm talking about, but uh, if your state is on this map in yellow, um, you have it there in your backyard, it's there to choose. And some dentists have said, well, I'm gonna try it for a trial size for one month. One month is not enough. I mean, you need to do this thing for a year. You need to make sure that every new patient that comes in, where did you come from? And then don't say, well, they gave me 15 patients. Dentists will always say, well, they gave me 15 new patients. And one of them was that Margaret lady. And she came in here without any shoes and she just wanted me to smooth something off. She was a dirt bag. Yeah, but there might've been another patient. They got two crowns, a root canal, a cleaning, then referred in her husband, then brought in her two kids. And before the year was up, brought in two of her coworkers who also brought in their husbands and kids. So you have to look at the aggregate picture. You gotta follow this stuff for a year. I show this case a lot because so much of dentistry is posterior teeth. I mean, when some guy comes in, how do you get a before and after picture that's emotionally appealing when all you did is rebuilt their second molar with the root canal and the crown? Um, whenever you get dentistry, that's a uh, anterior case. Um, this, this is a very attractive woman and the fact that, you know, she's got her hair done up, she's uh, uh, plucked out her eyebrows for God knows what reason, she's got a uh, mascara, she's got red uh, lipstick around her, she's, I'm sure there's an earring under there if you pulled her hair back. And so you're thinking, why does a girl do all this and then have two fangs? And then you sit there and you fix her up and you have these in your waiting room and this, this triggers emotions. Now, when you walk in there with a rough tooth or something in pain, you have a need. And needs that, you know, what is the insurance gonna pay? But this is emotional, this tag's emotional. Oh, I want that. And it's gonna be based not on price, but on cash flow. So stimulate a lot of emotions. Uh, there's a close up and uh, there's afterwards. I mean, look, look at the difference there. I mean, that, that I think, uh, it just turned this girl's smile around and to tell and uh, she let me use the case. I mean, my gosh, she digs this case. I use it at the, uh, the movie theater up the street, uh, Harkins or AMC movie theater. Uh, this is real easy for me to design because once again, I just stole the whole thing from Steve Hayes, crossed out uh, his logo and his name and my number, put in mine. Uh, and, and Steve Hayes does this because he's very high self-esteem. He thinks of abundancy, not scarcity. Put in my logo, today's dental, 893 care. Uh, form a visual image, 48th Street and Elliott in the Safeway Plaza. Because in a movie theater, you don't have a pen and pencil. And you're like, oh, my phone number starts 893. I can remember care, all Rick Kirshner. Oh, he's in the Safeway Plaza. I know where that is. Oh, yeah, I've seen that on that building. Oh, I know. And then a lot of dentists say to me, they say, well, you know, no one wants my associate. They all want me. Well, I mean, what kind of ego trips have? There's 161,000 dentists. 
and you really think everyone wants you, the only reason they want you is because someone's selling you. You're putting your name on everything. Or your front office receptionist has been with you for 20 years. Um, now you have an associate, and she's up there all day long saying, well, do you want Dr. Good, or do you want the new guy? When I brought in my first associate, and the front office says, yeah, but Dr. Good, they all want you. I said, well, who thinks they all want me instead of my first associate? And like half the hands went up, and I said, okay, great. Write your names down. And if you five can't sell this dentist, I'm going to fire your butt. And I'm going to find someone that will. Because if you say that everybody wants me, that's what you're thinking because you're emotionally attached to me because you've been here a long time with me. It's all emotion. There's 161,000 dentists. And there are 19 dentists across the street that you can even pick out of a police lineup. It's not about me. It's about them. Keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on the customer. One eye on the customer. One eye on cost. And um, don't suffer delusions of grandeur and quit selling yourself. Sell dentistry, sell bleaching, bonding, veneers, braces. Um, here's another before and after uh, bleaching, before and after bleaching. Uh, I hang this in my office. People say, was that, was that, is that like photographically enhanced? No. And then you pull out that little shade that Discus Dental does. It's so great where, you know, they come after cleaning. Bob um, Dorfman taught me this. And I mean, it's unbelievable, Discanol. It was just that little photo deal where you, it has a shade guide, and you check off where they are, and you check off where they'll be. And don't just subtract two shades, because you do that to an 18-year-old girl, she's going to be very upset. She's going to say, you said I was here, which is almost perfectly white, and you said I'd be here on the paper, eat Clorox white, and it didn't happen. Remember, every year they get older, bleaching is more dramatic. If you want be dramatic before and after bleaching cases, um, get a 50-year-old, get a 40-year-old smoker. Uh, they, they don't even remember what their teeth looked like in the first grade. Um, here's more market differentiation. Uh, if you're going to sell um, dingy, dark, dirty fillings and gold crowns, uh, my gosh, everyone's going to be insurance driven. Do quadrant dentistry, a la Bill Strupp taught me that. Just say to the person, by the way, I'm going to have this whole area done. This person came in for this crown, recurrent decay, need a root canal, yada, yada, yada. I'm going to say, by the way, you know, this stuff's all 20 years old. I'm going to have this whole quadrant numb. If we just did the whole thing, you'd be one fourth done. And then you get out your intro camera, you take a before picture, and then you, uh, then you show them what's under it in the second picture. Then you frost out with your uh, Denmat micro, uh, 50 micron aluminum oxide to at about 100 pounds of pressure in your airlines. It'll throw that sand about uh, 200 feet per second, whereas your KCPs and your Kratom Mach 5s and your uh, uh, Air Midwest will throw it about 600 feet per second. You show them what it looks like all cleaned up, and then you, you uh, show them a final picture, and they just dig it. External marketing, uh, go door to door, get out and press the flesh. Always write letters that are dentistry shows up the news. You stop right there, you go to Microsoft Word, and you sit there and you, you punch out something, 200, 250, 300 words, fax it into the editor. I mean, I've had so many letters to the editor. Anytime dentistry shows up the news, boom, that day, and it's timely. You know, if dentistry's in the news, the editor wants something to respond to it in the morning or the Sunday edition. They don't want something a month later on your to-do list or on your bulletin board. Dental Health Month is February. Get out there with the fairs, the parades, the carnivals, uh, public health um, screenings. Um, they're doing that all the time. Call your office dental health and ask them, when's the next time you're having a school cleaning, a school fair? Get involved in your community. Um, Movie theater screen advertising, referral services like 1-800 Dentistry. Do cooperative advertising. Start with your state dental society. If we could get every state dental society to start a statewide advertising campaign and to start democratic elections where we give the person a two-year term and a chance to get reelected, by the time the 27th state has a state advertising campaign and a democracy will have leadership, will have marketing, and then all we got to get is the, the three big software companies, Densply, Patterson, and Shine, to merge with one of these coast-to-coast -coast banks with a trillion in assets to have installment credit wired into our computer so that the, uh, the credit history is being done the minute we enter the patient's name and data, then we enter the treatment plan, push financial uh, FA, financial arrangement, gives them three Installment credit options, pay all today, paid off over a year, paid off over two years, paid off over five years, and dentistry will top the $100 billion a year in sales. And I'm talking about in the year in 2,000 real dollars, not in a billion dollars uh, when you're uh, inflated away. And yellow page advertising. I have never had a year where the yellow page advertising wasn't a three-fold return on its investment. Um, you know, um, deal with your churches. Um, get in their church bulletins, find out 
uh, target markets of language groups. And when anybody comes by your school and they're raising money, you know, you go to these, uh, I'll be out there on a sunny morning and I'll see some local high school girls soccer team doing a car wash. And not only take my car in there, because uh, I like to jerk my four boys chain, uh, um, you know, have them get out and uh, tell all the girls they're washing the car that these boys are all out looking for a wife and is there anybody in your class and they're all uh, crawling under the car dying. But I'll say, are you guys going to do a raffle or anything? I have these in my briefcase. I'll say, really? Well, here, this thing, an examination is uh, 50 bucks, a full set of x-rays, 100 bucks, the cleaning's about 100 bucks. This is worth 250 bucks. Why don't you raffle this out? Oh, wow, thanks. How many can we have? And uh, just, it's free publicity. It's community involvement. Um, you know, we talk about external marketing. When you have a new baby and you have your little birth announcement, don't mail this stuff. Uh, why, you know, you, you want, why would you want your patients not be your friends? Okay, you wouldn't, you know, your mom always told you not to loan your patient, your family members money. Mom gets very mad at that if, you, if there's any loan of money because they say that could be a source of involvement. And if something went bad, you know, maybe you guys had quit meeting together and things like that. You're not supposed to loan your family money. And then what do you do? You loan your patients money. Then they're not your friends. Why would you send your friends a birth announcement but not go to your computer? I'm on soft then It'll print out labels. So when we have a birth announcement, my gosh, we treat them just like family. I don't like to do the Christmas card thing because Christmas is it's emotionally chaos. Everybody's running late. Everybody's spending their money. No one's sitting home reflecting. Pick, be unique. Do George Washington's birthday. Uh, George Washington had wooden teeth, and we don't think you should. Um, you know, just uh, look at the mass hypnosis that external marketing can do. Um, we know in a community that children, here, get close up this, because my boys, they really need to see how good looking they are. I guess they have a good looking mama. And uh, here's my four boys. They're at this, end. This, this, is the, this is the bedrock foundation growth of a community. That's why if you bring in these hot colorimeters where, you know, uh, four day to water, between birth to 11, um, besides sugar in the diet, which is the number one determinant variable, your teeth are gonna rot. Fluoridated water is number two. We got kids out there drinking reverse osmosis water, nothing is. We got people who buy a house, they don't know if they're on city water, county water, they don't know if there's an RO unit in the house, they don't know if it's charcoal filtration, they don't know what they got. And we market, you know, your kid needs to be drinking fluoridated water from birth to 11. We have a handout sheet. Go to the yellow page underwater and type out every company that sells bottled water, put down their name, their uh, phone number, their address, and then put in columns like, do they sell four data water or just reverse osmosis water or mineral water or what is it called? And you give them a list, you do the homework up front. And, and mom brings her three-year-old in, you say, mom, um, are you, um, are you or does the child drink fluoridated water? And mom says, well, well we uh, use bottled water. Well, what kind? And she says, well, I think it's uh, Arrowhead. Well, is it this type or this type? Oh, I'm not sure. Well, from birth to 11, the child is building these buildings. To build a building, your tooth, you need bricks. If you build this building without the bricks, it's a very crappy building. After 11, the thing's built. You build a crappy building one time, it's crappy. I don't care if you go and paint it and remodel it, put in carpet, it's a crappy building. It has to have fluoride from birth to 11. The only dietary source you're gonna get is you eat ocean products. Does your child eat seafood every day? In Japan, yes. Singapore, yes. Hong Kong, yes. Taiwan, yes. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, yes. America, no. It's meat and potatoes, no ocean products hardly at all. Even in coastal communities like San Diego, people don't eat seafood uh, more than once a week. So uh, when you say this, mom's like, wow, I've been going across the street for three years. My kid has two fillings. He's got a chrome silk crown. How come nobody told me this? I said, well, you know, they're, 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 I don't know, they're, they got their eye on the mirror, they're provider focused, they're, they get up every morning saying, me, 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 self, 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 me, me, self, self, me, 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 self, and they're not customer focused. When you walk in my office, I am you. I am looking at you. I look at you, get out of your car. You got these two kids. I look at your work schedule. I'm thinking if I had this work schedule, when can I get to the dentist? I thought, man, if I had benefits, I'd want the guy to accept them. And if I had benefits, um, I've never dealt with insurance companies. I wouldn't want to mail this out. That's why we take their insurance. Every stupid question dentist asks me, they go like, well, why do you accept their benefits? I mean, I mean, I mean, what a self-centered provider focused question. Be your consumer. Be George Patton, who believed he was Rommel, and that's why he slaughtered him. More um, stuff. When, when, when you're proud of dentistry's past, focus up on this. This is, um, you know, here's the, uh, um, 
When water fluoridation started January 25th, 1945 at 4 p.m. in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where they adjusted the water from 0.3 parts per million to 1.0 parts per million, which is a level found in the ocean because the Earth's crust, uh, 13 most common element in the Earth's crust, fluoride, it's in the ocean one part per million. It had its 50-year um, celebration January 25th, 1995. Over 1 billion teeth were saved, according to the Centers of Disease Control, National Institute of Dental Research, National Institute of Dental Health. So I have this big banner. Congratulations on 50 years of water fluoridation. Over 1 billion teeth saved. Uh, that didn't cost, I, I think that cost like 50 bucks to make up. We left it up there for uh, a couple of weeks. And this makes the, the person who walks in your office that doesn't know if you operate your root canals with silver points or Jenny, lateral condensation, vertical condensation, thermophil, plastic carrier, stainless steel carrier, titanium carrier, they don't know that stuff. But they look at that sign and think, this guy has pride in dentistry. This guy's into his job. Americans love it. When they see someone, um, they make funny remarks like, well, you know, he's a workaholic. I mean, he loves his job. You know, that's all he does. He's just totally into it. And, and that, that energy, that emotion, they like that. They reward that. They think this guy is into it. And, and it's true. I mean, you are. Social orientation. Improving consumers' or society's well-being. That's a very good marketing position. You see this with Ben & Jerry's ice cream. Um, you know, you buy their 14% buttermilk fat ice cream so that you can have a coronary bypass, but you don't care because they're saving some rainforest in Amazon or whatever. Um, ben and, Paul Newman, Paul Newman kicks the butt and all the all this um, profit goes. Um, he's got some salad dressing thing. Your deals, water fluoridation or the anniversary of sealants. Um, Get some social orientation in your community, whether it's every February educating the kids on how to brush and floss, whether it's uh, whatever it is. Just get involved. And if you don't know the name of the dental director of your office of dental health in the blue pages, it's a dentist or a DDS, DMD with a, with a master's in public health, sometimes a PhD in public health. If you don't know that person's name, you don't have a social orientation dentistry. How could you be a dentist in your state for 20 years and you can't even tell me who the dental director is of the public health, but after Delta Dental goes out and sells billions of dollars with the insurance, you throw rocks at them. See, this is a very self-serving attitudes that are, that are plateaued and portrayed all day long in the dental media. It's self-serving. It's, 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 it's actually embarrassing. Um, when dentistry comes out, and you, if you just bought a new $50,000 YAG laser 10 years ago. After $50,000, why didn't you call the newspaper? You just got microabrasion. I go to city after city after city where people bought this 10, 12, 20, $30,000 air abrasion machine, KCP 1000, Create a Mach 5, uh, Dent Supplies, uh, Air Midwest, and uh, my gosh, about only about 1% or 2% are smart enough to sit there and call up their local newspaper and say, hey, I just bought a $20,000 machine so I can do a filling without doing a shot. And they're like, wow, um, um, can I swing by about 1 o'clock, take a picture? I mean, um, it's so easy to work with the media. And, the, and to understand who works the media the best, watch politicians. I mean, they're always calling a press conference, and the only person out there listening to him is the guy's staff. And, you know, like, you know, Dick Gebhardt. Um, by the way, Dick Gebhardt, you know, not only is he dumber than Al Gore, but what's weird about Dick Gebhardt is his mother is actually the most smartest person in the world. I mean, the instant Dick Gebhardt is born, I mean, her mother named him. She just looked at him and said, Dick! And uh, production orientation. Uh, the goal of the firm is to make the best product. Uh, uh, sales orientation. The goal of the firm is to push the product. Spend money on advertising or sales and customers will follow. Smart practice is a good example. Or market orientation. The goal of the firm is to determine the needs and wants of the consumer and deliver satisfaction more effectively and efficiently than competitors. Or a societal orientation. Market oriented but also heavily focused on improving customer or society's well-being. And man, if you're in dentistry or healthcare or cancer or cardiovascular, if you're a sovereign profession in healthcare, it's got to be number four. I mean, we can't be a sales push-oriented uh, deal. Uh, we need to be a societal orientation. Um, sales orientation is more cosmetic, dentistry, veneers, bleaching, bonding. We do that. That's great. It's easy to do that subtly with, with want advertising before and after pictures, et cetera, and just taking off the ugly stuff off the menu. That's how I really push most of my cosmetic dentistry. It's not so much a sales push, advertising, bleaching, bonding, veneers. I just took all the ugly stuff off the menu and uh, people started leave, leaving Days Dental. Um, going back to 1980, about 19, I opened up my practice in 87, by 1990 I threw away all the church raiders. And, um, 
and, and you know who the pioneer of that was for me is Bob Ibsen of Denmat, and it was also Ron Jackson, which, which every cosmetic guru that you can name today took the first 89 to 99% of their material straight from Ron Jackson. And this guy, um, he basically said, well, he's in a small town in the middle of Bumblebutt nowhere, but all he did is just took the ugly stuff off the menu. And then people start saying, well, I wanted a silver one, but I guess a white one's okay. But after you put a white filling in their mouth or their mom's mouth or an all porcelain crown or whatever, it didn't take until about 93 or people saying, man, this is hot. Now they line up in groves to get this stuff. So just take the ugly stuff off the menu. You don't have to push cosmetic dentistry. It's the only thing on your menu. Go to Pizza Hut and order a bacon cheeseburger. They don't have it. They took it off the menu. Go to gosh darn uh, uh, McDonald's and order a pizza. They don't have it. Each person took a different um, business uh, approach, a different strategy, a different market segment. Your business unit mission, in, in context of the corporate mission, goals have to be specific, measurable performance goals. You have to identify your core companies, um, strengths which give your dental office a competitive advantage. Is it looks? Is it longevity? Um, I try to tell the patients a lot that basically cosmetic dentistry is a label that insurance companies and the consumers gave it. But the roots of cosmetic dentistry actually come to adhesive dentistry. Silver fillings are wedges. You bite on them long enough, they wedge the tooth apart. Um, and adhesive dentistry glues it back together. Then do a SWOT analysis. Um, a SWOT analysis is just a grid. On the top you put, what are the strengths of this? What are the weaknesses? Then the bottom, the, what are the opportunities? Uh, what are the threats? And, and are they internal or external? Um, what, what are the critical strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats um, for doing uh, all tooth-colored fillings versus amalgams? And do a SWOT analysis for amalgams. Do a SWOT analysis for composite fillings. Do a SWOT analysis uh, for if you're not going to advertise 1% on marketing and hang on to your fee versus SWOT analysis if you're not going to do marketing and give up a 30-year fee to a PPO. Just lay it out graphically, and it's easy to make high-quality decisions. Um, these are right out of the advertising. In fact, I'm right here in Scottsdale in the Tom Hopkins Institute, which is kind of romantic since this guy was one of my idols growing up. And uh, he, wrote the, he wrote the original book in sales, and this guy's amazing. And right here in his own backyard, about a block away from right now, here's these people advertising about leg vein removals. And um, right there in the Sunday paper, um, Newsletters are so important in identifying your cosmetic dentistry. In fact, I, I got into newsletters actually when I moved out to Phoenix. And the person that um, got me into it was I moved out to this little suburb in Phoenix. Is about 80 per, in a five mile radius of my air office, it was 80% European, 20% Hispanic, and less than a half of 1% African American. And I'm sitting there and I'm living there about a, uh, a month and I realize that my city councilman is the longest running, continually elected city councilman in the history of Arizona, and he's an African American in a, in a district that's 80% white, 20% Hispanic, and he's the longest running city councilman. I thought, this is bizarre. So I called up his office because, you know, you think there's a glass ceiling or, or whatever, 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 all the stuff that the media tries to hype up because they want everybody to be a victim, not to be independent. So I called up Calvin Good. And I asked for a meeting with him. I went in there and I said, hi, I'm Howard Friend. I'm a dentist. He's got a dental school. I've been a practice for 40 years. I'm Calvin. I'm sorry. To, I mean, this is a weird uh, deal, but I, I just want to know, how does an African-American be the longest running city councilman just to begin with? I mean, I just want to know that first. Then number two, I want to know, how did you do it being an African-American in an 80% white district, 20% Hispanic district? And he just smiled. And he put his arm around me. Really nice personal guy. He says, Howard, he says, people don't go to the polls and vote because they're, the guy's an African-American or Hispanic or an Asian. He says, everyone follows their own self-interest. You know, people will snidely remark, oh, the Americans, they just go to the polls and vote their pocketbook. He said, what are they supposed to do? Go to the polls and vote your pocketbook? What are they supposed to be standing in the polls saying, I wonder what Bill Gates wants me to do? Of course everyone follows their own self-interest. Go back to Adam Smith, 1776. He called the invisible hand. He said, if the government gets out of the way with no force and coercion and lets free people trade, Everybody's going to be trading their own self-interest, so everything will be the most efficiently. And anything done to interfere with efficient trade for your own self-interest screws up the whole country. 
And he says, I have a newsletter because I, these people, they send in letters, they have problems, I get solutions, and I got to get a newsletter and I got to get it out to him once or twice a year or every quarter and let him know, by the way, you know, you know, I, I didn't, uh, um, you know, win World War II or I didn't bring down the Berlin Wall or anything like that, but, you know, I was getting some complaints about this intersection needing a stop sign and I finally got one there. It's the little things in their own self-interest. Oh, mom, you guys were uh, screaming, yelling about cars going 45 miles an hour by the school and you're, and, and people are speeding there all day long. And, uh, my gosh, wait, I got a, uh, I was able to get a, a motorcycle cop there and I got him committed there. He's going to be there eight to five Monday through Friday during school. I got him budgeted for the whole year. I work with the police officers, yada, yada, yada. In fact, it was amazing there in his office. I had no idea. You know, every time a cop pulls you over, um, you know, you can sarcastically say, yeah, he doesn't want to get out there and go chasing hardened criminals. He just wants to write, you know, easy tickets all day long and harass the me. You got to go stand in the city council office. I had no idea. About 50% of their complaints are about people speeding in their neighborhoods. I mean, if they answered every complaint, there'd be a cop on every corner. Uh, now you see photo radar going up. You got to look at their own self-interest. But Calvin Good taught me, keep your eye on the customer. And I don't care if you're African-American, you'll be A, the longest running city councilman in the Arizona history, uh, which is what I want to do as a dentist. I want these people to come in and stay with me for 40 years. I wanted to get reelected every six months at the recall. And two, follow their self-interest, not your self-interest. Um, and, and, and I don't care how tacky it is, right now they got all these uh, uh, non-surgical solutions for impotence. I mean, look at all the um, uh, advertising out there for Viagra. You know, 40 years ago, everybody would have thought that was an embarrassing thing you can only talk about in the closet. Now people are openly gay. They're openly on Viagra. You got Bob Dole out there from Kansas, Russell, Kansas. I'm from Wichita, Kansas. Here he is telling everybody, oh yeah, if old Bob Dole's going to get a heart on, it's going to cost $10 and it's going to be a little blue pill called Viagra. And he's saying it's great. This, nothing's embarrassing anymore. Follow your own self-interest. Why would you worry about the guy across the street wondering that you're impotent? Why would you be embarrassed to go communicate to the village that, hey, if you're impotent, take a pill? And we're finally breaking out all these stupid cultural biases, taboos, customs. Finally, people are starting to leave everybody alone. And you've got to do that. You've got to position yourself. Cosmetic dentistry is about once paid for on cash flow, not needs that are price determined and they don't really want it. They have to have it. They need it. They hurt. They, something broke and they hope their insurance employer will pay for it. More external marketing. When I first opened up, I took my little flyer and whenever we didn't have a, 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 a patient or maybe if I had two dental assistants because I had, I opened up and uh, I had uh, um, you know, your two dental assistants, if I was in one room and the other assistant was having nothing to do for an hour, she would take this flyer and she'd go out to the parking lot and she'd put one under their windshield wiper blades. And everybody says to me, dentists are always, um, they, they send me the weirdest letters. They, a dentist, I got about a hundred letters over the last 10 years, dentists say, well, you know, um, in my uh, shopping center, uh, it's against uh, the, the CC and R's. We're not allowed to do that. I said, well, I said, where are you from? And they go, I, I'm from LA. I said, right now in LA. Someone's driving around with three pounds of cocaine in their trunk and you're afraid to put a flyer in the parking lot. What do you think you're going to do? Send out the flyer, please? Have you arrested? Put, confiscate your house? Okay, it's against the CCNRs. Okay, uh, maybe I'll think about it after the first notice. Maybe the second notice. My center gave me seven or eight notices. And finally, the guy just came out there and told me I was an asshole. And I never heard from him again. Take a gosh darn risk, man. You're not talking about running coke across the Mexican border. You're talking about a flyer in the parking lot. And then what I would also have him do is I would get the names... I got the, the names of all the new people that moved in each month. And I would sit there and I'd write, um, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Jones. And I say this out looking. I, I wrote this thing myself probably a thousand times. Congratulations on your move to, um, to, to oh, I actually got to read it now. <laughs> Congratulations on your move to the South Mountain area. It's such a beautiful community. It's a small town atmosphere at the edge of the big city. If you need a dentist in the area, we'd love to serve you. Thanks, Howard. See that, Howard? No artificial barrier to communication. I'm a doctor and you're not. No, doctor, you're low self-esteem and they're not going to have a relationship with you. Thanks, Howard. And people come in, I swear, about a third of them would say, do you go by Howard? <laughs> yeah, I want you to talk to me. I need to know what's wrong. I need to know what you want and need. If I do something that doesn't work, I need you to communicate. Here's my card. It's my home number. Communicate with me so I can help you. Um, Bob Ibsen says, founder of, um, president of a cosmetic dentistry, Den Matt, wrote the first book, Adhesive Dentistry, teeth are the picture, lips are the frame. Uh, I mean, if that doesn't say it all right there, uh, nothing will. 
So you sit there and, uh, you know, this emotionally creates wants. I don't care if you have this picture in every deal, in every operatory. The number one rule in successful case presentation is that they are done based on your customer patient's needs determination. The number one rule in blowing case presentation is when they are done based on your customer patient's disease status. Uh, you need this broken tooth because it's got a crown or cavity or whatever, but don't you want it to be uh, tooth colored or, uh, and I got um, a mile across, a mile down the road from my office is a large Indian reservation, Guadalupe Indian reservation. I have people come in from that Indian reservation that need a root canal buildup and crown on their back teeth and they don't even want it pulled. They want me to file down a virgin tooth and put a gold crown on it, okay? Well, I do that because they want that and maybe it'll make them like their teeth. Maybe they'll start flossing just that front one. So find out what they need, uh, find out what their disease are and then try to upsell that to what they want. And, um, and also on the chart, never walk up to a person say, you should really bleach your teeth. You'll offend them. They'll point back and say, yeah, you should lose 20 pounds, get a tan and wear a wig. Ask them on the chart. Do you love your smile? It, uh, rate your teeth on a one to five, five being perfect, one being uh, um, ba basically broken down, whatever. What, how do you rate your teeth? If they rate it a five, do they rate it a four? Show lots of before and after pictures. And this is a staff member. And what I like to do with the staff, if they're really into it, Try to talk your staff into just bleaching their upper, not their lower. If you bleach all the teeth, they, 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 they don't understand. They need contrast, okay? White is white when it's next to yellow, dingy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, on any given day, I'll have three or four staff walking around with three shades of difference between their upper and their lower teeth. And, uh, and then you just sit there and show them a the little tray. And when you're talking to about bleach, um, it's not nearly as stress-free as when the assistant or the reception it. We know from physician studies, there's a lot more practice management knowledge among um, physicians because there's five physicians for every dentist. That's why in the Fran report, my 48 page monthly no advertising newsletter that goes to 35 countries, is um, we have massive amounts of reprints from a lot of the medical economic magazines, the modern healthcare, things like that. But the physicians have done a lot of research and they find out that if a cardiovascular surgeon walks in there and tells you about your heart disease and your need to have a bypass, your retention rate is almost zilch. If the registered nurse walks in, you'll ask more questions, you'll retain more. If the LPN walks in, um, she'll retain more and even ask more questions, and, but you actually retain the most when your stupid cousin Eddie walks in, who doesn't know anything about healthcare, and he babbles on about everything he's heard about a bypass from back on the dairy farm, and you, most of your attitudes, customs, beliefs, and knowledge actually from him. So we know there's a direct, perfect, negative association between how many questions you ask, what you retain, what you're listening to, as someone with a higher um, social status is communicating with you. That's why you should just drop the social status. Drop that doctor stuff, drop that artificial stuff. I don't even communicate to you in a suit. Why do I want to walk out here in a three-piece suit and stand behind a podium and be real professional? I want to, I, I want to talk to you like we're two guys in a fishing boat or, or out king salmon fishing or something. Communicate, build relationships. Um, that's also why I have no problems talking about my wife or my children. God, if we were together, we'd talk about our wife or kids. How come you'll go to uh, 50 lectures in a row? No one will even mention their wife. They won't show you a picture of their wife. They won't picture your children. It's probably because they're divorced three times. They're dysfunctional people. They're on stage, egomaniacs. Build a relationship. Do that with your patients. Do that with your friends. Do that with your sovereign professional dental colleagues. I walk into dental office after dental office after dental office, and there'll be six dentists in one damn building in the middle of nowhere in Poria, Kansas. And I'll say, when's the last time you had lunch with any of these other five guys? Um, oh, I don't know, I, mean, was, I think it was five years ago and I, I forgot why. You're a damn dentist in the same building and you haven't had lunch with these five other dentists? That's disease, that's dysfunctional, that's fearfully falling forward, that's scarcity, that's, oh my gosh, they might get a piece of my pie. Why don't you all get together and grow the pie? Why don't you all get together and put a lit sign out front and say, um, dental world, um, call uh, uh, this number and it'll be maybe an answering service. And the first call goes number one, second call number two, you all chip in on it. Think in abundancy. Go see Stephen Covey. Uh, go to his boot camps. Read Seven Habits of Highly Effective uh, People. Read Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families. Think in abundancy. Don't think in scarcity. Um, that's how Bob Ibsen's always thought from day one. 
He, everything he knew, he wrote down, he showed everybody. That's why Bob Ibsen's the only dentist who started out of dental school, just like you and me, and they, he did 100 million in sales last year. Um, when you show pictures all over the wall, all you gotta do is point to two eight by tens of the wall and say, well, do you want that or do you want that? And if they say, oh, I want that. If they do say, well, uh, which one's cheaper? Then I'll have to say, it doesn't matter. I don't do that stuff. You know, when they took the lead out of gas, uh, I started doing fillings without mercury. And, uh, you know, you might think that it's just uh, cheaper. But see, these things are wedges. They don't glue the tooth back together. Every time you bite down on these fillings, the two structures getting split apart. Seems like every time I do a root canal or a crown. In fact, did you know, sir, you know, when you're 90 years old, you only have seven teeth left on average. Uh, two things have to you. By the time you're 90, you're a girl. Uh, all the guys are gone. Uh, I don't know at what age it falls off, but at 90, they're basically women with seven teeth. And you know what seven teeth they are? They're the only seven the dentist never touched. First time he touched his tooth, he took a drill and, and, and uh, structurally blew it to hell. Then he put a big wedge in there. Every time they bit on it, wedged it apart. And all he's done is drilled on it, weakened it, put wedges in it. Every time a dentist touches your tooth, he condemns it to retreatment down the road to buy, find you're 90 years old from the last generation. They all ended up in a trash can except for seven teeth. I like this adhesive dentistry. You call it cosmetic because it's tooth colored. I call it adhesive dentistry because it glues everything back together. In fact, I took that other stuff off the deal. If you want dentistry like that, there's plenty of dentists go down there. Go look for an HMO, a PPO, or maybe, uh, you know, you'll, I'm sure you'll find someone doing it, but you're not going to find it at my office because I can't do it. I'm going to treat you like I treat me. Now, if you didn't have the money, it'd be different. But I'm out here in Phoenix. Everybody has a car. Everybody hits a drive through at Taco Bell. Everybody's 30 pounds overweight. You've got the money. Uh, you just have to want it. And they're like, okay, okay, that's fine. And see, you just talk like that. They're not going to get up and say, I demand cheaper, shittier dentistry and walk out the door. Because think if they walk out the door. Now it's fear of the unknown. They got to go find another dentist. They got to make an appointment who you know they won't have available accessibility. That could be another week or 10 days. Then they got to get their x-rays transferred. They got to fill out a chart. It's too much a pain in the ass. I know that hurdle rate. When I take stuff off the menu and you're already in there and it's professional and name tags and everybody's smiling and everything's going great. That's when I just slightly raise up the hurdle rate and say, no, we don't have that junk on the menu. You want that stuff? Go somewhere else. And, um, and, the, and, I, and every single dentist. Now, now, Gordon Christian taught me one of the biggest tricks in dentistry, and that is if you're in front of a crowd every week and you're wondering a question, keep working the crowd. Keep saying, by the way, has anybody tried this? Yay, nay, like it, not? I mean, all uh, lecturers just have instant surveys all week long, every, you know, 50 times a year. Why a solo practicing dentist is all by himself or herself in office. And it's so much more intellectual than to be on the road. And a lot of these things that they, they tell you on the road, uh, no one would publish or they wouldn't really define an article for a long time to come. And um, we saw this stuff with, uh, you know, composites were uh, sensitive. Well, you, you hear this all the time. And basically, um, Let's go to this one. Um, in fact, let's get a cue let's, like that um, close up. Um, what happens when you light cure is that the composite shrinks up off the floor. It shrinks towards the light. And you have more sensitivity with you have more enamel. The occlusal composite are most sensitive because you've got a bonding all the way around the enamel, which is a very good bond because enamel is 98% inorganic rock, only 2% organic. You get a very good bond, whereas Denton's only 68% organic rock. Uh, inorganic rock is 33% organic. It's a very weak bond. Uh, everything shrinks towards the light. It pulls up on the floor. Then everything they bite down, you get a little trampling effect and it works your donoblastic tubules and it's sensitive to the nerve. And every speaker out there says they don't get no sensitivity. It's true because uh, they've never called the patient that night a week later. They're usually enlisted. And if you're in their office while they're telling you about no sensitivity and you go back and you flip through your schedule and you call, um, 10 all portions of ceramic crowns, inlays and onlays, and I call 10 in a row, and I've done some of the biggest things in dentistry, and you know, a lady will say, oh yeah, I've been eating Motrin for two months. And then, and then the guy said, they're saying, oh, I don't get any sensitivity. And then I'm looking at the chart. It says right there, um, lady called in, doctor's out lecturing, tooth's waking her up at night, hurts like hell, I sent her to an endodontist, and then there's another note. Lady called back, yes, she went to the endodontist, uh, he did a root canal through it, da 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 and he's still standing there saying no sensitivity. And it's not because he's a liar, it's because he's retarded. I mean, my best friend, uh, Michael Murphy out here in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, works at a retard clinic, uh, a mentally retarded clinic, Perry Rehab. And every time I go over there and have lunch with these guys, I mean, there's all these retarded people. They're the happiest people in the world. You, you go up to a 40-year-old man, what are you going to do today? 
I'm going to swing. And then you go out there in the backyard and say, okay, it's snack time. And they're all excited and everything. Here you are stressed out of your mind trying to make peril, you know, doing all these things. I, retarded people are the happiest. If you want to get rid of all your problems, just go and listen. Uh, don't call any of your patients a week later and just beef up your marketing so you keep getting 20, 30 new patients a month. So as people get pissed off, they just go somewhere else and, you'll, and this will work best in the largest towns. Because see, the best dentist in the United States that I've seen are the 45 out of 100 dentists who are in towns without any of the eight specialties. Uh, they're in towns of two, three, four thousand. where if you hurt someone there or you got a problem there, everyone at church knows it on Sunday morning, everybody at the school knows it. Um, the best consumer-oriented dentists and the most profitable are actually in the small town. They got, they got less overhead. They have to get their game together because they get feedback whether they want or not. See, if, if in biology, Biology simply works on feedbacks. This happens and it causes a, a cascade complex that makes this happen. Well, if you don't know, if you flip switches and you don't know what happens, you might keep flipping the switch 10 times a day, not knowing that every time you flip it, some kid on the other side of the world gets hit by lightning. You just keep flipping it. But in a small town, you flip a switch and it comes back and zaps you in the butt. You're like, wow, that hurt. Well, what happened? Well, she came in, she had sensitivity. That's why Bob Ibsen, he said there and said true vitality. He said, you know what? If you do dual cures, this stuff cures homogeneously and doesn't pull away the bottom. And every time you bite on, it's not milk in the floor. And with the light cured, if this light does not cure it, because this light will only cure maybe two millimeters deep period per minute. And it's, and dentist doesn't realize that he's got a groove down here, or a little box, or a little divot. And in one area, you might have five, six millimeters of composite. Bob is telling me, I guarantee you, there's a chunk of composite there that'll be gooey 10 years from now. So by making it a dual cure, you can mix this stuff up, shoot it in a cave, and in six minutes, it'll be a rock. And if you think I'm on the payroll of Denmat, uh, actually, first, I'd like to say I wish, uh, but you know, he doesn't give me a dime for this stuff. Um, here's, his, um, here's his kit. You've seen it before. But think dual cures, and lots of people make dual cures. Um, many, many, many. Williams Ivoclary makes dual cures. Bisco makes dual cures. But you know, Williams Ivoclary is an interesting deal. Um, most of their cells is light cured, and they got a great dual cure product. And the dual cure is very popular and in Germany, uh, it's just not as popular here, but think dual cure. Uh, why does everybody like light cure, by the way? Because when dual cures first came out, they couldn't measure the exact amount of the um, base of the catalyst. And what would happen is you got color destabilization. And five years later, the color go away. Okay, that was the initial problem, okay? Now they can measure this stuff in moles of 0 .0000. Color stabilization is not an issue. And then other dentists come to me and say, well, this one uh, wears better than this one. Well, why do you always try to solve problems that aren't your problems? Is your problem in the last two years of all the all porcelain crowns you've cemented and all the composites you've done that they all wore down and they're gone or they're sensitive? You're always solving problems. You always shadow box with the enemy that's not there. Um, you're taking your 16th TMJ course and you didn't do any TMJ last year. You're taking a veneer course and you didn't do a veneer last year. But the real problems, um, does my daughter need ortho? I have no idea, I've never done an ortho case. And, and, you're, and you're sending a $4,000 case up the street every gosh darn week and you didn't go to Brock Rondeau's course. Or you didn't go to um, Richard Litz through MTS Manji's course. Um, solve real problems, your real problems today this year, last year, the last five years, composites have been sensitivity, and everybody says they don't get it is either an idiot or a liar or probably both, okay? So solve real problems. That's the definition of an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is someone who gets up every morning and says, what would be the most efficient return on my time and my money today? It's kind of like a non-entrepreneur walking into his dental offices and uh, it's on fire, and he decides that he's gonna um, sit there and treat the first patient in the waiting room. You know, you get up every morning and say, well, if I have $50,000 in the bank and I got 24 hours a day, how could I get that, um, how could I get a 5% return on my money today instead of a 4.999%? When a 65-year-old grandma gets up in the morning, the only thing she does is realize that a CD matured and she found that she could move the CD that was paying 5.1% to 5.11%. Grandma's an entrepreneur. That's the comparative advantage. That's the efficiency of the invisible hand entrepreneurs and their own self-interest always getting the highest return on their time and money on each day by day. This is your problem today. If you're an entrepreneur cosmetic dentistry, solve sensitivity today.
When I show you actual cases, I like to show you very, very average cases. It's very easy for low self-esteem people to stand up here and show you the best case they ever did, but then that makes you feel bad. I like to show bread and butter, middle-class dentistry, but one thing I just want to point out is that a lot of people have problems with contacts. Try a biting ring, okay? Um, a biting ring wedges the teeth apart better because it's metal. And uh, the wooden wedge separates the teeth, but as it imbibes water, it gets soft and mushy and the teeth come back. When you put a wedge in there, it separates it initially, and in five minutes it's collapsed. Uh, or what you can do, what Gordon does, Gordon says, yeah, he has a wedge in there, but right when he's ready to put it on the composite, he puts in a fresh wedge, puts in a fresh, hard, stiff wedge, and then does it. Number two is, on your chair side chemistry set, you can't bond to dentin and enamel if it's filled with slush. So this mess here is right before I go in this tooth to do my chair side chemistry set, I want two things. I want a dual cure just in case the light doesn't get all, and I want to be on dentin and enamel. So I take that little $100, $200, I don't know how much it costs, that little Danville micro-etcher. There was a 50 micron aluminum oxide at 100 pounds of pressure in your airlines. They'll throw it about 200 feet per second. Whereas the KCPs, the Kratomach 5s, those $20,000 machines are throwing about 600 feet per second. Frost this baby out, get it all clean out. Then do your chair side chemistry set. There I am spraying it out. Uh, and then when you're um, um, using the dentin primer, you know, when someone says, um, uh, put on a one coat or two coats or three coats. I like to get a pipette and I would do, like to do the flood. When you're done flooding it, you know the whole thing's coated. If I took your house and painted it three or four times, I still might miss a couple areas. But if I took your house and threw it out in the middle of Lake Michigan, which was filled with red paint, I'm sure I got it all. And then don't air blow this out. Just take the suction and suction off the volatile compounds so you can leave your nice residue of your uh, hema and your primer and all that stuff there, hydroxyethylamine, methacrylate, et cetera. And then, um, then you put a layer of resin down there. And as you put the resin down there, if you're going to blow it, first blow your airline out. Make sure you blow it out first so you get a good feel for the pressure. Hold it four inches away and just thin. Don't get down there and blast. You're blasting out primer. You're blasting out resin. And these are why these courses, like going through Dickerson's LVI course, uh, and uh, which I think is two four-day weekends for the uh, initial one, then the advanced ones, another two four-day weekends, or the same thing with uh, Hornbrook at University of Pacific, with Dorfman. It's all the sweating, all the little details. You have to go through this course. I thought I was a pretty damn cosmetic dentist before I went to LVI back when it had uh, the Three Musketeers. When I went through LVI, it had Dickerson, Hornbrook, and Larry Rosenthal. If that wasn't a gosh darn treat, I don't know what would. And I thought I was a pretty sharp cosmetic dentist before I walk in there. I had never been so humbled in my life. Those guys sweat the details. I mean, that took me to a whole new level. In fact, I, I'll never be able to thank those guys now. Hornbrook, Dickerson, Rosenthal, unbelievable. So you think you know this stuff. Um, so then you, you sit there and you, you put down your area, you, you air dry it out, you put down your resin, you lightly thin it out, and then you hear you see me shooting in a dual cure. And I know I'm probably the only cosmetic dentist out there that does dual cures, but gosh darn it, we call everybody at night, and while well, Jan's calling everybody a week later, and every time I keep reaching for light cure, Jan always gonna ask, she goes, Dr. Frank, come on. I don't want to sit there and get some sensitivity off this. And then we light cure it, uh, a full mint on the top, a mint on each side, because remember a dual cure. If you don't light cure it, the dual cure, the, the chemical cure, uh, tertiary amines, that's only about 50% of the potential polymerization. The light cure is the other half. It's a dual cure, not an auto cure. Okay, dual cure, half of it's going to come from light, half of it's going to come from chemical. The light still needs to hit photo initiators. Sure, there's a tertiary amine chemical cure, but you got to do both. Then you sit there and you take this thing off. Now, the stain, everybody talks about, you know, putting a little stain on there and putting some stain on the top. And I know they do that um, to impress you. And, uh, but, you know, I didn't pay for this filling. The consumer did, okay? And um, I sit there and show them the filling afterward. I show them the filling. And I have 90% of my customers say, well, what is that brown stuff on top of it? And finally, I'm like, well, do you see all the natural brown shit in your teeth? This is fake brown crap to match all the natural shit in your teeth. You know, last year, they got 1.1 million boob jobs done. Did anybody walk in there and say, I'd like a really natural boob. I want to take my shirt off and I want people to say, that's natural. Hell no, they go in there with these, they want these rubber titties that one points up at Jupiter and one points up at the moon and they lean back in their chair, the thing doesn't even move. Their husband's standing there with two black eyes. Nobody wants natural.
Okay, so you know, and who's teaching you this natural staining and all that stuff? It's always male dentists. Does that male dentist put on makeup? Does he wear a girdle? Does he have pointy shoes? Does he pluck his eyebrows? Does he uh, wear a lipstick? Okay, why is he putting fake brown crap in the top of their teeth? Wayne Gretzky says, go to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. Go to where the market is. Keep your eye on the customer. Um, Thomas Watson, uh, uh, senior founder and CEO of IBM, said, I'm no genius. I'm just smart in spots. But I stay around those spots. The only unique selling proposition I have is I was born in an entrepreneurial household. Dad had nine restaurants. And when you grow up in those types of environments, you keep your eye on the customer. When your dad works at the Lion on GM and your mom stays home to make cookies, um, you go to work and you, you listen to all this dogmatic force feed the market of what's the, that you know best and you're going to teach the customer. Um, dentists are artificially programmed on how they look at teeth. Consumers look at teeth naturally. That was a brilliant insight that Dan Fisher, founder and president of Ultradent, uh, O Blessings Products, he's got dual cure composites. And you know, Dan Fisher, every time you go up to Salt Lake, uh, you know, you get in a car and I can go see Dick Barnes and Sandy. I go see um, uh, Dan Fisher, he's right there on the edge of Salt Lake. And then a mile uh, to the uh, north is uh, Gordon uh, and Rella, the god and goddess of dentistry. And stop by, these are your supply chains. Don't sit there and try to get the lowest price supplies. Try to get a relationship. You go in there and you let them give you a tour of Ultradent, talk to their scientists and why they do what they do. And Dan said to me, I was talking about stain, and he said, customers look at teeth naturally. We look at them silly. And I see that with my wife. My wife grew up with five brothers on a dairy farm, pulled three transmissions. I grew up five sisters, played Barbie doll size 14. And I'm still surprised I'm not gay. And you open up the hood of the car. I've never changed oil. I've never changed spark plug. You can tell my wife, my, my wife's in there, and that and that and that and that and that, and she's yeah. I have no idea what she's talking about. Do you think when you lift up the hood of your car, do you think a mechanic and a little boy playing Barbie dolls is looking at the same thing? See, I, I, all I see when I lift up the hood is there's a damn thing spinning around. If it took off my hand, I'd be bankrupt, okay? I'm not lifting up the hood of the car. And my wife sees millions and zillions of things. Well, if I'm paying for it, I'm the customer, okay? And uh, what percent of a denture is bought for function? What percent of a denture is bought for cosmetic, mental health, dignity, and humanity, says Dan Fisher. I mean, think about implants. If 89% of the dentures and parcels converted to implant-retained prosthesis were women, obviously it's not form and function. It's I'm 55 years old. I lost my teeth at 17. I've been married to Frank for 40 years. He's never seen me one time without my teeth in. And then, have you ever seen mom and dad, grandma and grandpa come in? You go into grandpa's room and say, Grandpa, did you bring in your partial? You know the one that, that's for your front three teeth? He goes, damn, I forgot it. Damn it. I set it out by the car keys. I was good. Damn it to hell. I'm sorry. Then he yells wife, Margaret, why didn't you remind me to wear my damn partial to the dentist? It's okay, Frank. It's just, you're just going to the dentist and it's just your front teeth. Who would remember that? Then you go into the next room. She's got a partial. Frank's been married to her for 40 years. He's never seen it without it. In fact, one time I'll never forget, man, I was scared that I was at, at eating lunch. And this Mexican restaurant with uh, two of my sisters and my receptionist. And this man brought, walks out to me, and he's about seven years old, and he goes, um, what, are you, what are you doing to my wife? I'm like, <laughs> who the frick are you? I, and, and Jan's like, uh, what, what's your name, sir? And, uh, and, and I, I said, well, what's the deal? I don't, what, what's the deal with you? What, what are you guys doing down there? Whenever she goes to your office, she tells me I have to leave the house by 7, and I'm not allowed to come home until 5 o'clock. I'm saying, oh, my God, that's right. We're relaying her denture. She came in. She dropped. We, we re took an impression of her denture. We're going to reline it. And they come in at 7, and they pick it up at 5. And, oh, my gosh, here's this woman. He didn't even know what we do. And then he says to me, he goes, um, what do you do? Does she, that her teeth, do, do they, like, come out? Or are they, what, what's, how, what does her teeth work? I'm like, whoa, I'm not even touching this. I said, well, Frank, I mean, she's your wife. Why don't you ask her? Uh, I don't know. The assistants do all the work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's weird. Now, that's their generation. Remember, senior says that's the generation who nostalgically miss Walter Cronkite and uh, David Brinkley. And they say all the modern media for the baby boomers and, uh, is, uh, is 48 hours, 60 minutes is, is unprofessional. They See, these two people are too old you know, to realize that David Brinkley was fired. Walter Cronkite was fired because their ratings suck. And now the Generation Xers... Generation Xers, who rules them? Howard Stern, Rush Limbaugh. We got three different societies. If there was a if, if there's a man in America who gets married at 21, 
and finds out his wife doesn't have any teeth and wears a denture. He's like, cool, right on. And, uh, but if you're over 65, they're like, you know, it's like, uh, what's all that about? It's dignity. It's cosmetic. It's mental health. It's humanity. And, uh, and, and that's why bleaching is so easy to sell. As long as you know who your target market is, and as long as you visually do what Discus does, check off the stain they're at, and try to accurately predict where they go. And remember, the minute you check it off, they've got a score. It's in writing. That's why digital, uh, that's why the computer enhancement stuff was a disaster because people would come in and say, well, here's a computerized before and after picture. And you said my chin would be out to here. And look at the picture now, it barely moved. So remember, don't get bullish on these deals, but give them something to look at. Um, mental health is far more important than dental health. Always remember that. Show contrast. Here, here's a lady. Now, I like to show this veneer case because any cosmetic dentist would look at that and almost puke. I mean, they look like white chiclets at 150 feet. But you know what? Um, how many boob jobs have you ever seen that you thought looked natural? I mean, gosh. I mean, they, they, and you know, it's weird where you go around the country. You go to California, and um, they're they're more likely to be kind of small and a little perky. By the time you go to Texas, it got. Do you think it's an airbag installed in their chest? How they fall down, bounce back up. It just depends on your culture, customs, traditions. But uh, this lady, I mean, you tell me that didn't change her whole wedding deal. She came into my deal, and she's getting married. She always hated her teeth, um, her lower teeth. Uh, in this picture, look just like her upper teeth did. She wanted veneers. I said, well, you know, I'm always say, well, how did you envision these veneers to look like? And she goes, oh, I just want them. I want them bright and white and straight. And, and I'm looking at pictures and she's looking at the, and the, uh, I said, well, can you bring in some pictures? That's a good one. When they bring in something that looks like piano keys and I put them in her, I mean, think about what she's thinking. She's getting married and all white. And look at that. I mean, my gosh, she cried when we installed them. She got married two weeks later. That made her wedding day. And, and she, she let, and there's her before. And she just, she just, I mean, there's a beautiful girl. There's not a man in the world that would look at that girl and notice her damn teeth, okay? And we certainly wouldn't look at her and notice she's wearing pointy shoes or a girdle or plucked out eyebrows. That's just a pretty girl. But you're not that girl. She looks in the mirror and she's seen her. These are internal wants for her, not your dogmatically force-fed stuff. Here's guys coming in, uh, more bleaching cases. You might not think that's dramatic. Well, that's a big deal. It's subtle. But have I have no less than 10 before and after 8x10s every room. I probably have 300 8x10s all around the office. Here's a, uh, uh, actually, I, I, uh, this is actually a tough case. Here's a uh, girl. She's got PFM on two teeth. She was in a car wreck, uh, had a seatbelt on, uh, tooth hit the, uh, clipped off these teeth. They needed a root canal. The guy did a root canal, metal parapose, two PFMs. This girl's a fox. She's gorgeous. She won't even smile. You notice these girls, when they laugh, they cover their mouth because of this. This is so, I mean, I mean, you can get me to wear a rug or a wig or a hair transplant if you put a gun on my head. And this girl's a fox, a body to kill for, and she won't even smile showing her teeth. And then we sit there and uh, um, go close up on this, some of the before. Yeah, there's a before, there's the after. And I mean, she ages. And you know, it's not fantastic, great. But in her mind, I mean, it, it was everything. And uh, here's, a, here's a smile when she smiled. I, I guess it's true. But I mean, this girl's a beautiful person. And, uh, and then there's afterwards. Uh, now, and you notice this? Uh, she comes in. She doesn't like to smile. She doesn't want to attract attention to her mouth. Notice that she didn't have lipstick on? I didn't tell her to come to my house not wearing lipstick. Hell, she probably, if I called her up and said, when you come to your appointment, don't be wearing any lipstick, she probably wouldn't have showed up. She probably thought, what the hell is that all about? And uh, go close up again these, on these dental pictures. And uh, so then she comes in, knows she's got lipstick on, she loves her teeth, you know, and women are so cute. They always send you, they always go out and send you a greeting card or, you know, some little hallmark thing or something. There's a side view of it. And there you go. And it's, it's the little things, Dennis. I don't want to sit here and show gazillion dollar full mouth rehab cases because that's not the real market for the middle class dentist. Once again, every time I go to veneer course, I say, how many veneers did you do in the last month? Uh, none. How many did you do last year? One set. Uh, you're in an inclusion course for six one-week longs. How much TMJ do you do? None. Why are you here? Well, I think I should be doing full mouth rehab TMJ stuff. No, you shouldn't. You should find the gold mine in your practice. It's a little stuff of cosmetics. Here's a guy, and, and I uh, did this one with pool cleaner. You know when you clean your pool, pool it's muriatic acid and pumice. 
All you do is you go to the pharmacist and say, I, I don't want to use my pool cleaner because it might be unprofessional. Uh, can you just give me some muriatic acid in a bottle and put a label on it so it looks professional and mix it with a little pumice? That was muriatic acid and pumice in a profi cup five minutes after cleaning. You know why I can do this on this 18-year-old boy who loves me for it? It's because when you get your hair cut, when you're done getting your hair cut, they always give you a mirror and say, how does that look? They even do it to me. I don't even know what to say. I'm like, uh, God. That looks great. And they're like, really? You like it? And I go, man, that's the best haircut I've ever seen. And they're like, oh, I'm so glad because I did this and this. And you're thinking, what a fruitcake. But you're excited that they're into it. I mean, I'm not even into it. It's my head. They're into it. And after every cleaning, we sell the most dentistry by giving them a damn mirror and saying, how does that look? But see, you're so provider focused and, and measuring the gum scores and getting the x-rays and getting your fluoride treatment and writing up the chart and going to get Dr. Numb Nuts and doing all this stuff that everyone was so focused on the provider, no one even thought to lean over and say, by the way, I just clean your teeth. How does that look? And the guy says, well, I don't know. I don't think it looks very good. I mean, how come you don't get that spot off? Turns out this kid went across the street for five years. And his mother's, and he said to his mother, how come they can't even get that off? His mother said, I don't know, maybe that hygiene's nuts. Why don't we try another dentist? My girlfriend told me that she took one today's dental, and she had her teeth white like never before. Let's go talk to them. And, and I didn't even charge it to this kid. I mean, how, how do you charge for two drops of muriatic acid and some pumice in three seconds? In fact, I don't even know if I did it or if the hygienist did. And I don't know what the expanded duty laws are, so I never say anything to uh, and condemn myself, but I'm sure the hygienist did it. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, you know, here's a guy come in, cosmetic bonding. You know, in the olden days, um, how many people would have had to have that file down for a crown? Which is, in my opinion, when people are hacking front teeth down for a crown, for a chip tooth, that's garbage, man. Um, this stuff, I uh, couldn't talk him into ortho. Look at that big old overbite, but uh, he likes it, whatever. Uh, this lady came in. Now, this is the funniest case I did because this lady came in. And, you know, I really try to, you know, I want to do dentistry like Dickerson and Hornbrook where you put mammalian grooves and stain. Um, well, let's go back to this case so you can really get a good look at this. Uh, you know, I, 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 I want to put stain, mammalian grooves, really naturally sexy. Every time I do that in Bumblebutt Phoenix, they're all mad. They want white chiclets. I put in this lady's teeth. She comes back to me and she says that the canines are too pointy. She wants them flatter. Hell, I barely made it a canine. In fact, this is the only girl I lost. I said, look, when you came in here, when you came into my office, Jeffrey Dahmer wouldn't eat you. And now you look at that and you're bitching that there's a fang or whatever. I mean, I mean, these people, they want hideous, ugly, white chiclet. They want boob jobs that point up over and, over and back of their head. But give them what they want. And always ask this, you know, on your recall lead, like, don't go out there and say, have there been any change in your health history? Uh, does your poop float or sink? Uh, ask him stuff like, have there been any change on your health history? Has there been any change in your medication? Then go to sales, identify one. Say things like, uh, um, do you love your smile? Have you ever considered bleaching your teeth? Have you ever considered braces or orthodontics? Um, you know, yada, do you love your smile? Do you like your smile? Has other people ever complimented in your file? Get out of all the just uh, rehab and the uh, um, medical and health history and all stuff. Um, also identify once. Um, you know, find out what these people want. And once again, if, if you... I could find articles all day long say adhesive dentistry is better. I could find them all day long says amalgam is better, okay? If you're a good lawyer, you just say, well, what, 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 what site are you on? I mean, you're the client, you're giving me money. Are you innocent or are you guilty? I mean, I don't care if you hacked your wife to death in her own backyard. If your name's OJ, you can find a scum-sucking parasitic attorney named Johnny the Cockroach Cochran to defend you. All you got to do is go up there and say, uh, Here's all my money. Uh, why don't we go with um, that I'm innocent? And Cockroach Johnny says, sure, fine, great, let's do it. So I, if you're for amalgam, your HMOs, PPOs, get literature, hand out, support your position. Uh, if you're against it, if you're against amalgam because you don't like this leaching out uh, from acoastomy retrovirals, you don't like the way it shatters teeth, look at that, little buckle pit, thing fractures the whole side, cleans out the whole side. Um, if you don't like it because it fractures the inside of the teeth, uh, don't do it. Do whatever you want to do. And I also show these feelings here because I know that uh, my very best friends who I get along with great, Dickerson, Hornbrick, all these guys, they, they'd all look at this stuff and they'd just say, in fact, they even say to me, Dickerson to me said one day, he said, Howard, don't be calling yourself the Walmart dentist and put some stain out. You can do a better job than that. The reason I do a better job than that is because I do stain and groove and they get mad because there's brown, ugly crap. And the, it helped the, if the filling's whiter than the rest of the tooth, you know what they say? 
you know, the filling's even whiter than my tooth. Do you think if I bleach my teeth, the rest of my teeth would be as pretty white as my new filling? I mean, think about it from their perspective. If you, if you didn't graduate from the eighth grade, uh, you're not thinking like that. They, they don't know. They don't know what this garbage is. No one knows what that is. There's not an American in Ahwatukee that could tell you which one of these was the worst product, which one is the best. Um, so I'm um, just... Um, no one cares about phosphoric acid. No one cares about Bowen's formula, HEMA, 4-Meta, phosphorated esters. Um, Tony Robbins says success is the real result of good judgment. Good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from making decisions, both good and bad, if you got feedback. This, this is a picture of a dentist, and, and uh, he's bonding in his silver fillings. And uh, the, guy, the guy writes me a letter from Australia, and he says, Well, if you like white fillings because they're adhesive, did you know that you can bond in silver fillings? It's like, what kind of an idiot would go through all the steps of adhesive dentistry to the end, plug a big turd in? I mean, if I'm going to make something this ugly, I can, I can do that in four minutes. But if I'm going to bond it in, it's going to take me 20 minutes. And if I'm going to spend 20 minutes to do it, might as well make it tooth colored. And people, um, they love this stuff. This is the future. This is, uh, this is the old stuff. This is the new stuff. And I can show you, you know, anybody can do the good stuff, but only do this good stuff like that with a stain and anatomy and grooves if the patient's up for it. If they're up for this stuff and they want this stuff and they appreciate naturalness, there are girls that want a boob job where they can take their shirt off and you couldn't even tell, I mean, you couldn't tell at all. But there are other people who don't want that. They want this Dolly Parton thing, whatever. Um, you know, and you know, and you're back there with a the microscope. There I am back there in my scope, uh, trimming my own dyes. But that is not a market differentiation to my customer. That's an anal retentive thing uh, that I was caught doing that day. You cannot, Adam Smith said in 1776, you cannot dogmatically force feed the needs of the marketplace. Give them what they want. Do they want to walk from Phoenix, Tucson? Do they want a moped, a motorcycle? Do they want a used car? Do they want a Chevrolet? Do they want a Pontiac, an Olds, a Buick, Cadillac, Mercedes, Rolls, Lears? As the price comes up, the quantity comes down. You're the market, you pick a segment, you find out what these people want. It's the same thing with, you used to make a cake from scratch for 50 cents, then it, as time went on, now the value went up, it was a, in a box, Duncan Hines for three bucks, then it went to buy the cake already made for 15, now moms go to Chuck E. Cheese Pizza, they don't have a dime, and spend 50 bucks. This, uh, do not do porcelain fused, uh, do not do all porcelain margins. They are not, uh, go back to my finger here, this is not metal. That is an all porcelain margin. That is the root, okay? Lab men, give this tape to your lab. When dentists send in say, I want an all porcelain margin, they don't know what's going on. Tell them to put on a pair of 4X loops and realize they're looking at the root, and they take off that crown. Immediately that root is illuminated by light, and it looks just like this. Then you put in an all porcelain crown, and the lights don't go out. You put on a porcelain fused metal crown, and this is what you're looking at. When you send in an all porcelain buckle margin, uh, you, you, you don't get it. It's light illumination of the tooth. And I want to end with this case. Anybody can do a great case. But I'm just showing you. Here's a case where, um, you know, here she is. Here's her. I thought her teeth looked beautiful before. The, you know, you can do natural ones with mammalian gears. I think these look very uh, uh, nice. But the point I'm showing on this case is that there she was. I told her, if this was me, I would just smooth down the two front Bucky Beaver things. I wouldn't do 10 upper veneers for 5,000 bucks. And she's a gorgeous girl. Her teeth are pretty. And what does she want to do? She wants to spend five, ten, or I think it was 5,000 bucks for 10 upper veneers. And the moral of the story is the prettiest people with the prettiest teeth pay for the most cosmetic dentistry. I mean, there she is. She was gorgeous to begin with. Let's file down your two front teeth. Oh, no, let's spend $5,000. Let's do 10 upper veneers. So that's the word dental mania. If they're already there, they're going for it. If they're not even close, they're not in the race. Thanks for another fun day.